going to be the last message in this particular series of Walking Straight in a Crooked World. We could go on in many other topics, and we will hit them on down the road, but next week we start our um, ascent into Easter, and I'm excited about the Easter season. Man, it's, it's our time as Christ followers, and so I really hope and pray that you see it as an opportunity to invite someone to come with you to hear the gospel and to hear about the Lord Jesus Christ. But uh, today we're going to uh, wrap up this series on walking straight in a crooked world. I hope this has been a good for you. It's been great for me. I mean, it's it's. I mean, it is really so applicable to where we live uh, today. And and uh, you know, but the question we ask sometimes is is man, is, is it reality in our culture? Mark, can I walk in purity in our culture? Can I walk a life of purpose? Can I be a giver in a consumer world? Is this even possible to really really happen? You know, I'm reminded of the rich young ruler story in the scriptures where the young man had it all together from a physical standpoint, financial standpoint. He had done good deeds, and he comes to Jesus and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? You remember? And Jesus said, well, go sell all you have and give it to the poor. And he walked away sad, and Jesus said, how hard it is for a rich man to get into the kingdom. And, uh, man, the disciples said, if a rich man can't, who can? And Jesus said, with man it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. And I believe in a day that seems to be pretty dark in some areas, God is wanting to shine his light ever brighter. And I really believe that. And today, I think, will be just one more push towards us saying, okay, God, we can do this. We want to be different. We want to walk straight in a world that seems crooked and, and out of line. We want to walk it straight. We want to walk it according to your book. We want to walk it according to your plan is what we want to do. And so I want you to turn with me to Joshua chapter 24. Joshua was in the Old Testament and, and uh uh, we're going to be looking at that in, in just a minute. And so if we were to call this something today, we, we could call it the power of decision, but I want to call it as for me and my house. And we're going to be looking at this um, from a couple of perspectives today. One of them is just on decision making. And, and uh, you know, when it comes to decision making, we're all facing decisions. I mean, I don't know what yours are. Some of them are life altering some of them are just where you're going to eat lunch today, but we're all facing decisions. I remember I spoke at a men's retreat a few a few years ago, and at this particular retreat, in one of the break sessions in the afternoon, we uh, they had a ropes course. Many of you have done ropes course. Some of you have done ropes course. And we went through the ropes course. It was all fun. At the end of the ropes course, then they had what was called a pamper pole. You know what I'm talking about. It's a skinny old uh, telephone pole that seems like it goes a thousand feet in the air. I don't know how high it goes, but but it goes up, and you you are to climb that pamper pole, get to the top. This particular pamper pole had a box about the size of a shoe box, and what we would do this particular uh, we would tandem. So one would climb up the pole, and the other one would climb up, and both of us were on that little shoe box at the very top uh, up there, and you know. I don't know if it's the pole or your legs, but, man, it just feels like, if you've ever done this, it it, it just, man, your heart rate, you, you know, just out of, out of sight, man, when you're up there. And just the panicky feeling, if you've ever seen that. Even though you're belayed, you know, you're thinking, good night, but still, you know, it's it's that fear factor. And you're out up there. And once you're up there, that's one thing. The next goal, objective, is they've got this trappy swing that seems like it's about 50 feet away, but it's probably about 6 feet to jump out to, and here you are uh, standing on this thing, and and then then the, to to make I think matters worse sometimes is you've got your group down below you, who are waiting to do what you're going to do. Some of them are encouraging, yeah, I go, and some Yahoo that's done it before is thinking, man, he's taking forever up there. You know, I mean, you're getting both extremes of of what's going on down there, and you're thinking, man, I don't know what do I climb back down? You know, what? No, got to jump. And you jump out there, and I, I, I actually was able to reach the, the swing, which was amazing, and, and, and to do it. And then they let you down, and it's like, man, I'm glad I did that. But, you know, I, I got to thinking, that's how many decisions are in life. We're, we're, we're up on the top of that pamper pole, and we're faced with this incredible decision on what we're going to do, and, and we're, we're thinking, I don't know how to do this. And, and there's a couple of things on decision-making that I want to tell you up front before we read the Scripture one is this, is you can't remain neutral in life. I mean, most of us, 
you know, we say France is neutral about everything, the country of France. But, but sometimes we want to treat life that way. It's just we want to be neutral, but you can't be neutral. You've got to be moving. You, you, you're, if you're not moving, you're going backwards. And so you, you, you can see that in decision-making. But some of the things I've learned about decision-making, and many of you have faced these or you're facing them right now, is one is this, is that decisions require a response. Um, going back to that rich young ruler where Jesus said, go sell all you have and give it to the poor, his walking away was a response. You can't just stay in that place. You have to respond. The next chapter in, in, the, in the scriptures is a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, wee little man, wee little man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to. Okay. So we know the story of Zacchaeus. He wanted to see Jesus. He was seeking Jesus. He had climbed up in that tree, and he comes down, and Jesus says this, I'm going to your house today. And basically, salvation is coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus responded to that decision to have Jesus in his house and to follow Jesus. And what he did, he, re, he reimbursed all of those that he had taken from, and he gave above and beyond. There was a response. When, when you're challenged with a decision, you can say in your head all day long that that's what I decide to do. But until your life reflects a change, you have not responded. Here's another thing about decision making. No decision is a decision. To say I'm not going to do that, well, you've already decided. That's what you've decided. I'm not going to respond on that. But no decision is a decision. And right behind that is if you don't make the decision, somebody's going to make it for you. Some of you have faced decisions and you were, you, you were scared on how to respond, so somebody made that decision for you. Ronald Reagan, who was President of the United States, when he was a child, his mom took him to a cobbler's uh, uh, shop, a shoemaker, and took him there and wanted him, wanted a, the cobbler to make him uh, a, a pair of shoes. And so the cobbler asked Ronald Reagan, as a boy, he said, do you want squared off toes or do you want round toes? And Reagan, recounting the story, said, I don't know. I don't know how to decide. And the cobbler said, well, you make the decision. I'll ask you in a couple of days what you want. And he saw him again. And he said, well, do you want squared off toes or do you want round toes? And, uh, and Ronald Reagan, as a young boy, said, I just don't know how, how to decide. And the cobbler said, well, you come to my store tomorrow and, and I'll give you your shoes. So he went the next day. And Reagan, recounting the story, saw this pair of shoes that was handed to him. And what do you think? One was round and one was square. Now, you don't make the decision. Somebody's going to make it for you. And some of you have faced that before. You say, I just don't know what to do. It's whether it's with your career or whether with marriage or whether do we have children or whether whatever we do, you don't make a decision. It gets made for you somewhere. And it may not be what you ever wanted, just like Reagan's shoes. And, 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 and we face those decisions all of the time. And I'm here to tell you, folks, you better be warned in our day that is not walking straight, that is very crooked. If you make a decision to not decide, to not make a decision to walk with the Lord, you will end up walking that crooked path. I promise you. I see it all the time. So I want to look at Joshua chapter 24, and we're going to begin with verse 14. And I, and I want you to understand the background here is the background is, is that the children of Israel, you may remember through Moses, came out of Egypt. Through their disobedience, they wandered for 40 years, and then Joshua takes over as leader. Moses dies, and what happens is, is Joshua takes them into the promised land, and they see God do wonderful things. I mean, he just is clearing out the war, the, all that took place, so that they could have the land. And then Joshua divvies up the land among the tribes, and now we're coming to the end of Joshua's life. And Joshua is confronting the people because he's about to go. He's confronting the people. How are you going to decide? If you've ever read the prophet Joel in the Old Testament, the prophet Joel talks about a place called the Valley of Decision, that God is with you in the Valley of Decision. And, and I think that's so true when we enter into these valleys of decision. So I think this will be very practical to us today as we look at it. So let's look at Joshua chapter 24, beginning with verse 14. I'll read a little bit and stop, and we'll look at it. It says this, Joshua's talking to all the children of Israel. Now, fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. 
Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, and that word undesirable actually means harmful or evil, or very hard even, I guess it would be a way to look at it. If serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves. This is a personal choice. Examine. Cling to what you're going to say. But choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But, I love this as Joshua as a leader. He's going to lead. As for me and my household, as for me and my family, as for me and my lineage, we're going to serve the Lord. Uh, this is. Let's just kind of look at this just a little bit. Where he says, now fear the Lord. He's talking about live in reverential awe. The God who just guided you through us taking this land. You live in fear of him. And, and he uses the word serve him. The word serve literally means to uh, get connected to, to worship. You see, when we worship, when we come in here and Brett leads us, we're, we're coming to acknowledge the Lord and we want to get connected to him and we want to stay connected. We want to stay in tune with him. And that's what he is saying here. You get connected. You fix yourself to the Lord and you worship him and choose. And I love this. Choose today. Did you know that the, uh, I don't know, i got to speak for me, but I think I know human nature enough, that if I have a chance to put off a decision, I will put off a decision. But if somebody says, you've got to choose right now, now there's an urgency and I need to do that. And that's what Josh was doing. He says, listen, you've got a personal choice and it's not you're going to make next week. You've got to make it right now. You're either going to serve God or you're not, but we're going to make this decision today. But then this is a great leader. This is what Joshua says, but so that you know you're not in this alone, as for me and my family, we're fixing ourselves to God. This is what we're doing. That's a great leader. And so the people have to respond to what Joshua has said. So look at verse 16. Then the people answered, far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods, it was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. Now look at this. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. That's their first time to commit. That's their verbal commitment. We're too going to do it. But you know what they're kind of saying with it when you throw that two in there? Okay, Joshua, if you're going to do it because you say do it, we're going to do it. But look at their reasoning. I love their reasoning because they talk about God himself. They, they mention four things, basically. God brought us out of the land. He led us into a new place. He protected us. And what he did was he drove out the enemies that were before us. Have you ever thought about what Jesus did on the cross and you responded to that? I mean, we say, yeah, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. Yeah, but do you really understand it? We're about to step into the season. where we're, I want us to understand it even more. But this is what Jesus did for us at salvation. First of all, he delivered us out of slavery. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to this. We were in rebellion against God. And through what Christ did on the cross, he delivered us. The next thing he did is he didn't deliver us just to say, okay, now I'm a Christian, I'm going to go flesh it out. He gave us his spirit to lead us in a new direction. And then thirdly, he has all along been protecting us from the evil one. I know he gets tough sometimes, but he's protected us. And then fourthly, he has given us victory. He he, he leads us in victory. Let me tell you, that is worth serving an incredible God. And that's what they said. That this is what God has done. Far be it from us. This is what he has done. So we too, we're going to follow the Lord. Now, here's a good leader. Uh, look, at, look at the next verse there in verse 19. Joshua said this. He said to the people, you think he'd encourage them, right? Good decision, people. Good decision. That's not Joshua. He says, you are not able to serve the Lord. You... you you, you, you can't do it. You, you can't do it. How about that for a leader? You just made a decision, you can't even do it. 
He said, for God is holy. He is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, emphatic, no, we will serve the Lord. Man, I I love Joshua as a leader because he comes back. They've made their commitment for the first time. We're two going to say it. And then Joshua comes and says, listen, you can't do it. You can't do it. On your own, you cannot flesh this thing out. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you just said. You can't do it. And then he gives two attributes of God. The first one he says is he is holy. He is set apart. There is no hint of impurity in him. There is no hint of darkness in him. There is no hint of any rebellion in him. He is complete. He is whole. He is holy. The, The angels in heaven are declaring it all the time. This is how he is. And how are you going to come into the presence of this holy God? You can't do it. And then second of all, he says this, he is a jealous God. Now, I'm just going to be transparent with you. Whenever I've read that in the Scripture, I've seen it as a sign, I'm just being honest, as a weakness in God. God, you really have jealousy? I mean, if if you've ever been in a relationship or you've got somebody that's jealous, or or, it it almost sounds like you're insecure, doesn't it? You're insecure. And, And so I'm just being honest as I study the Scripture. But the deal is, you got to study the Scripture. And what, what it says about jealousy is most of us see jealousy as, I'm jealous that he has something I don't, or she has something I don't. And I'm jealous of that because of that they're that way. And I'm jealous because they may steal my boyfriend, or they may steal my girlfriend, or something like that. That's how we see it. We see it in that weakness. But that is not how it is pictured about God. What God, his jealousy is, number one, is he is fiercely protective of his creation he is fiercely uh, uh, he is fiercely protected of us and he is not jealous because somebody has something that he does not but he is jealous and that what belongs to him they're turning to another he's not insecure he's just letting his creation know i love you and when you turn to other gods you got to know the fierce protectiveness that is in me That's the kind of God that we have. He is completely holy and pure, and he loves you so much that it disturbs him when you choose other gods. It's almost like if you were to look at a a husband and wife scenario, if another man flirts with your wife, there is a time to be jealous because only you have the right to do that. See, it's the difference of, I'm insecure. No, this is, listen, this is mine. This is mine. God created us. He has a fierce love for us and a fierce protection of us. And with that, what Joshua is saying, listen, because God is holy and he is jealous, you cannot do it. You cannot serve him. You cannot do it on your own. And, and notice what the people, how they responded in verse 21. They said, no. Now, they're, now Joshua has gotten to them. No, we will serve the Lord. So now they've committed two times. Let's look at verse 22. It says, Then Joshua said, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. Yes, we are witnesses. I can just see them built up now, man. Joshua has given them the the speech in the locker room. Yeah, we are witnesses. Now then, said Joshua, basically because... Your decision. Remember, I told you every decision has to have a response. He says, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will. This is their third time. We will serve the Lord, our God, and obey him. He says there's two things. If you're serious about this, it's the one thing to say with your mouths you're going to make a decision. But I want you to know that if you're going to make this decision... There's two responses. One is you're going to have to throw away the foreign gods. What that means is is that um, you need to take inventory. You need to take inventory of what foreign gods you have let into your your house, into your life. I think it's the same thing for us today. When was the last time you took spiritual inventory of those things that you're allowing to block 
your relationship with God. Now, if we look at idols and false gods, many people say, how about media? Media would be a false god that takes our eyes off the true God. Maybe in the influence of the media, the philosophy of the world. But how about gluttony and self-indulgence? How about just hedonism and pleasure-seeking? How about affluence and we've got to have money? When was the last time maybe you just walked through your own home and took inventory? Lord, is there anything in this home? Is there anything in my office? Anything in my car that I've allowed to be a God in my life other than you? He says, put them aside. Throw them away. And then second of all, notice what he says in verse 23. He says, yield your heart to God. Yield. The word yield there in the, in the original language is actually a picture of stretching out, stretching out. It's stretching, give it to God, stretch out for God, but the yielding. But you know the way I look at it, when he says yield your heart, which is that your heart is that core of you, who you really are. You know, who you really are. Who you really are. And yielding is like when you come to that four-way stop and uh, you've got to yield to the right of way. If you show up at the same time, you're supposed to yield to the right of way. In other words, you give them full reign. You give them privileges. You give them access. And when we, it, we're out here on I-35, and if it's, moving, if it's moving along and a car is coming to yield in, what we do is we yield to the right of way. We give them access. We give them permission, basically, to take over. And this is the way it is with God. What Joshua is saying here, you need to go and you need to do inventory on your life and see if there's anything false of, of the Lord there. And what you need to do is you need to yield and give Him access to you. Man, tell me if that's not strong. If you're going to decide to follow the Lord, this is what's going to happen. And the people for the third time said, we will serve the Lord our God and obey Him. I thought it was interesting so I did a little study on why three times. And the number three in Scripture is a, is a number that often means completeness or wholeness. Father, Son, Spirit, whole God. Uh, we look at um, how many times did um, Jesus pray in the garden, let this cup be taken from me three times. It was the, it was the sealing of that struggle. Simon Peter uh, denied Christ three times. Simon Peter, when Jesus restored him, was three times. Uh, we see um, uh, we see other instances of just the three in in the scripture. How about uh, uh, days in the tomb were three days? How about uh, when the angels in heaven are declaring God? They're saying what? Holy, holy, holy. There's just a completeness and a wholeness to there. And I think when I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, the first time they said basically, okay, because you've done it, we will do it. Second time, he's got under their skin. They say, no, we're going to do it. And then thirdly, it was that we will obey. We're going to obey. And it's all settled in in complete wholeness. Now, I'm going to shift gears on you just real quick. And this isn't going to be long, but there's a point I want to make here. Joshua said this, choose for this day whom you're going to serve. But for me and my household, my family, we're going to serve the Lord. We live in a day, people, where the family is getting fractured. Not saying anything new to you. You see it all the time. The family is getting fractured. Marriages are getting fractured. Can't even define it anymore. It's getting fractured. And because of this, how can you and I walk a straight path with our families in a crooked generation? Three quick things. It's going to involve men, women, and then it's going to involve the family unit as a whole. Men, I want to say this to you first of all. Men... For us to walk straight in a crooked world, men must walk in godliness and boldness. Men must walk in godliness and boldness. And, and, you know, we choose to be godly. It just doesn't come by osmosis. We say we choose to be godly. And there needs to be a godliness and a boldness because, you see, as, as goes the father, so goes the family. We see that when... Cornelius came to Christ in Caesarea, that he came to Christ and his whole family came to Christ. When the Philippian jailer came to Christ, his whole family was baptized and came to Christ. When dads have their role in the right place, the family will follow. The problem is is that many dads have abdicated their role or abandoned it. And so what we're seeing is it's time for men to step up and be godly and courageous. In, In men's gathering that we do on Wednesday morning, we have a definition of manhood. And, and I know last Father's Day I gave you your man cards. 
Hopefully you still got them. But we use the acrostic, R-E-A-L, real. And the R, first of all, he rejects passivity. He's not going to sit back and just let the world tell him the way it's going to be. But he is going to reject that passivity and he's going to stand up. The E, he expects a reward, God's greater reward, but he knows it's not going to be on this earth. It's going to be after here. So in the, while he's here, he is going to serve God and he's going to be the godly man he's called to be. A, love this one. He accepts responsibility. He's not going to be like the first Adam that says, God, that woman you gave me, he is going to accept the responsibility himself. And then L, he's going to lead courageously. He's going to lead despite whatever obstacles come into his way. He's going to lead his family. He's going to lead out in a courageous way. Rejects passivity, expects the greater reward, accepts responsibility, leads courageously. I really believe that if men would take up this mantle, that we would see families able to walk straight in a crooked world. Now, that's, that seems like a lot to throw up on you all of a sudden. But men, what are we going to do? Are we going to abdicate our roles? Are we going to abandon it? Or are we going to step up? Secondly, women... Women must live, decide to live righteously and influentially. Righteously and influentially. Righteously. And I, and, I, and I know I used a different term. Of, I used the term godliness with men because it really says choosing about the godliness. But there's something about in the way God created you ladies and the purity and the righteousness of who you are that even Simon Peter says win them over without words. There's something about your inner beauty. And, you know, it's sad in the day that all of our young ladies are taught to measure their beauty by what the TV and the media and the red carpet tells them. And that's sickness. That is sickness. Women who are willing to step up in righteousness and purity. And I use the word influence. Influentially. The word influence, just so that you know the definition I work off of, is the capacity to have an effect on the character, development, or behavior of someone or something. The influence you have. And women, please understand, you do not understand the power you have, especially over us men. In 1865, a guy by the name of William Ross Wallace wrote a poem called The Hand That Rocks the Cradle. There's four, four verses, but I'm just going to read the first one. Blessings on the hand of women. Angels guard its strength and grace in the palace, cottage, or hovel. Oh, no matter where the place, would that never storms assailed it, rainbows ever gently curled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. You know, we've put up women, we think that's a woman of great influence. You know, we're, we're in the political season. You know, it doesn't matter what you think about uh, uh, Miss Clinton, Hillary Clinton, but she is a woman of great influence. And people look at that and say, man, that's great influence. We look at other people in the world and say, that's a woman of great influence. Let me tell you, the woman of great influence is the one who is rocking that cradle and raising the next generation. That's an incredible influence. So women, let me encourage you in some, in some things. Number one, be influential to men. We need your righteous influence. Left to ourselves, I'm going to give you a hint. We're jerks. We are fleshly by nature. We do not look at you the way we should most of the time. And it is sickening. And I'm not defending us. And I'm not blaming us. I think we can, we can overcome that. But you need to know reality. And we need you to influence us in righteousness and purity. We need you to influence young men. See, young men, we want to give them a picture of what to look for. And if they're looking for you to give that example of righteousness and purity, then they know not to settle for less. And we need you to influence young ladies. I've already said we're jerks much of the time. We need you to influence young ladies in purity and modesty. And we need you to influence kids, children, because you have the greater influence. I mean, yeah, as men, we have an overall umbrella that God has given us this responsibility, and we accept that responsibility. We should, but we need you to be the incredible influence. Men must decide, am I going to be courageous? Am I going to be godly? Women must decide, am I going to be righteous? Am I going to be influential? 
And then the third thing is this, is families need to decide that we're going to be God-centric. And here's what I mean by that, and I know I'm going against the cultural flow on this one. The picture of most families today is not God-centric, but it's kid-centric. The children determine everything. They determine everything that happens in the family. They determine when you eat. They determine when you go to bed. They determine what you do that day. They determine what you do that weekend. They determine where you move to. What are you going to do? And I know we have a responsibility according to this book, according to God's Word, to nurture, to provide, and to protect. But it doesn't say we are to worship them. And I know, I know it's difficult. I mean, I can't imagine something happening to one of your children or your grandchildren. I mean, it just rips your heart out. But we're not called to worship them. We're called to worship God. And we're called to leave a legacy that our kids are not going to love their kids in such a way that is worshiping them, but they're going to love God. And that's what we're called to do. I was, I was just rethinking about Job the other day. I heard a guy speaking on Job. Job had seven sons and three daughters. And he lost them all, just like that. Lost them all. Did Job grieve? Oh, yeah, he grieved. He grieved hard. But did he turn his back on God? No. I'm afraid many families today, if something happens to our kids, we're going to blame God and we're going to turn our back on Him because this is something that we have worshipped. And I know some of you don't like hearing that. You really don't. But we have to be God-centered. Our, our families need to decide. Our households will be choose to give God glory. Our households will choose to lift Jesus up to others and may, that they may know Him. Our households will choose to worship and serve God. We must be God-centered. You've got two stones. When you came in, should have. <clears throat> you know, it's one thing for us here today, and I'm about to lead you through an exercise of just you and your own decision. And today, it's easy to say, just like the, the we, yeah, we're going to serve God. Yeah, we're fired up. We're, we want to do this. And, and George Whitfield, the great evangelist, great awakening happened through England and the United States through George Whitfield. He was approached one time after a, a huge move of God at a service, and someone asked him, how many people do you think were converted, Mr. Whitfield? And he looked at him and he said, we'll know in five years. See, it's one thing to get excited. It's another thing where the tire hits the road that we're going to live this out. But what happened is, is that Joshua, if you go on in the Scriptures, is that he made a covenant with God for the people and the decision that he made, and he recorded it all in the book. And then what he did is he took a large stone and he set it up as a memorial stone. And he said, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. And then Joshua dismissed the people to their own inheritance. But he set up a memorial stone. We see this all through the book of Joshua. They would set up memorial stones, not to worship, but as a remembrance. And what I want to do today is I want to challenge you to, to make a decision. Draw the line in the sand. I can tell you this. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As much influence as I can have on my lineages behind me, we're going to serve the Lord. So I will stand up as Joshua did and tell you, this is my decision. And it's not just made today. This is my life decision. But I gave you two stones. And this is what's going to happen. Brett and the team are going to come up and lead us in worship in just a moment. One stone is for you to keep however you want to use it. If you want to put it, if you all have family devotions, I would put it there. I would put it where your kids are going to see it often. I would put it where you're going to see it often. Maybe you want to mount it somehow and say, man, this is our decision stone. This is our memorial stone that for our family, we made a commitment. We made a covenant with God that we are going to be a family, a household. Our lineage, even if your kids are grown, our lineage is going to be one. We've made this decision. We're going to serve God and obey Him. The other one, in just a moment, I'm going to challenge you. We have our memorial stone up here. 
I'm going to challenge you just to come. If you want to lay it on the altar, you want to pray by it, whatever you want to do, I'm just going to challenge you. God, this is, this is my decision today. My decision today. So I want to just take the stones in your hand and let me just pray. Brett, y'all come on. Lord, as I hold these stones in my hand, they're but rock. Man, Lord, they're but pieces of earth. But Lord, you gave us an example in Scripture of memorial stones just to remember. And Lord, right now, as I pray over these stones in my hand, I pray over all the stones in this this room, God, that, Lord, that we're going to, We're going to hear your Holy Spirit say to us today, choose for this day whom you will serve. Whether the foreign gods, whether the gods of this culture, whether the gods of ease and comfort or the gods of money and affluence, are you going to serve the living God? And Lord, I'm I'm willing to proclaim it to anybody in this crooked day. As for me and my house, we're going to do it God's way. And we're going to serve him. But, Lord, I can't answer for these people. It demands a response. I know you demand a response. So, Lord, I pray that over the next moments we will draw near and hear your Holy Spirit telling us what we should do. I want you to stand with me, if you would. Just And, I, you know, I'm going to ask the prayer teams to go down, come on down here and be available. Because some of you have prayer needs other than just family today. Some of you, before you can drop this rock down, you have to give your kids to the Lord. Some of us need to repent and say, God, I've allowed my house to be run by my kids. Some of you need to come to the parenting seminar tonight. Al will tell you about it in a minute, but you just need to get a handle on some things. You need prayer for other areas. On my right is the uh, is the Lord's supper some of you really find strength in that every sunday so i'd encourage you to take advantage but we're just going to open up whatever the holy spirit leads you to do i want you to be faithful god this is your time the whole thing's been your time but right now god we want to respond as you speak and we want to respond as obedience and say we will serve the lord you lift my